Go ahead. Just a reminder at the start that we must make a daily, hourly effort every minute, every second to apply these things that we're talking about. This is the this is the words, and we put the action in when we go out of here, or even as we're sitting here. So just a reminder of the need for personal and daily application. We're all at ease here now. Everything is quiet. But tomorrow you're going to be out in the world where these things can be used when something challenges. Now, we're going to make a very interesting investigation into the scientific, the scientific cause of physical violence and, because they're connected, of negative feelings, negative emotions, violent emotions. We're going to understand really why it happens so that if we, in working on ourselves and observing ourselves, can catch it, we can stop it, then we're not taken over. When we are inwardly violent, agitated, jealous, or what, obviously our mind has been stolen from us, has been taken over, right? We're not in control. You're not in control of your mind when you're envious, anxious, when you're in anguish, when you're hysterical, obviously you're out of control. Now start with this one basic fact and remember it, work with it. Try to see it, experiment with it. The mind works at a slower rate of speed than the emotions and the body. It goes slower. You do it tomorrow, you see this. Whenever you meet a challenge out there, or even an inward one, if you're not watchful of your own mind with what, you, what happens, it will be taken over, captured by a physical movement or by a negative emotion because the mind is so slow it can't see it. It can't see it coming. And so you're taken over. Example. This, this was on television a while back, some time ago. There's a couple of men, agitators of some kind, in some foreign country. And they were standing right in the middle of a hostile crowd. And they were preaching some kind of foolish political doctrine, opposite to what the crowd believed, the passing crowd. And they stood up there and preached, two, two young people. And after they'd preached a while, the crowd began to gather. And eventually, they were assaulted physically by the crowd. See, all the things connected with what we just said and what we've covered before of how a person, because their physical body and their emotions are in charge, instead of their mind, they destroy themselves. So strong was their vanity, their egotism, and wanting to be the center of attention for a minute, for an hour or whatever, that they were willing to suffer the consequences of this. In other words, their mind wasn't able to say, now look, you know very well, if you preach violence, which you are doing, that you're going to arouse the counter-violence in those people out there. The mind knows this. You know this. I know it. We know, deep down inside, the law of cause and effect. But they couldn't stop it. There was no way to stop it because of the overwhelming power of the, the feelings and the physical body too, because it's it's very pleasing to be up there and gesture and, and preach and all that. Now, so this is what happened to them. If you see that the mind works slower, that they're taken over, you can begin to make a correction. And we've had this project before of slowing down, for, for example, slowing down your physical movements, deliberately slowing them down, like reaching out for the salt shaker, or walking up and down the stairs. If you will do that, you'll find that you'll be able to see your mind operating better because the, the body, the physical body and the emotions, they both go much faster. Do not take it over. 
So as this is an exercise now, a reminder, and I'm going to give you another one a little bit later in the, this morning, as an exercise, deliberately slow yourself down physically, and you'll be able to see your mind operating in a way you never saw it before. Then, to, to bring this to a conclusion on this point, you'll be able to see that your mind can, when it is operating in its right place, forbid negative emotions, negative gestures, a clenched fist, for example, from taking over. Now your mind is in its proper place instead of these negative feelings and negative physical expressions. Slow it down, slow down the physical body, and you'll be able to see your mind, you'll be able to see things you never saw before. You have practiced this. All right, go ahead. Is there a reason why the mind uh, is slower than the body? That's just the nature of it. That's just the nature. But it is not a disadvantage when you understand and correct it. You see, an automobile is slower than an aeroplane, isn't it? But is an automobile therefore wrong? See, that is the nature of an automobile to go slower and an aeroplane to go faster. But there's no disadvantage. It depends on, on where, what you want. So there's no problem there. Now we're going to talk, keep that in mind and we'll go on to something else. And then we're going to, we'll have an open discussion. This connects, as everything is connected, what we're going to talk about now is what we just talked about. And that is the subject of self-dramatization. I see you nodding. Why do we dramatize ourselves? Let's start way back to the beginning and how do we dramatize ourselves? First of all, self-dramatization is an attempt to confirm, in quote marks, an illusion. I have a, a self-image of me being what, a great conqueror, a great lover, whatever particular images I want to have. And so by dramatizing them, both in my own mind with mental movies, as I'm walking down the street, I picture myself being the center of attention and all that, because I haven't watched it and stopped it, and therefore I've I'm asleep and I'll may get hit by an automobile if I'm not careful walking down the street. But it becomes very precious to me to have these images and this self-dramatization because I'm afraid to not be this image that I am. And out of this insistence upon dramatizing myself comes all they are connected all of my problems and all of my sufferings. I have an image of being what? Anything at all. An image will always be opposed by and contradicted by the reality in the outer world. I have an image of being an up-and-coming young business executive and I go to school for a long time and I make every move possible to to be successful. And then I go out into the world and to my astonishment and frustration and anger, the world doesn't confirm this self-dramatization, this image, and so I suffer, do I not? And of course I suffer needlessly because I don't see through the whole hoax of having these running mental movies about who I should be and what I should be. And of course I never see it because society itself is always screaming in my ear that I do have to be this or that successful kind of man or a woman. Women have their own particular kind of images, perhaps connected with their home, with their children. What kind of images? You ask yourself right now, is it quite possible that I may have images that are commanding me, that have taken over my mind, instead of living consciously without images, in which case I would be in command of myself and therefore in command of every external circumstance, command of every person. You understand, you have to understand this, you command every person out there by having no command over them at all. See, right? You see it. By need to impress you and even if I succeed, I've just ruined everything all the more, but even if I, if I should succeed, I have therefore 
ruin myself because I've confirmed an illusion a little more, therefore it becomes more hardened. And now I have a lot more hard work to melt it down. Work on the possibility that there may be images in your mind running through it, many more and at a much faster pace than you may imagine. And give yourself the shock of seeing them. It is so pleasant to live in daydreams, isn't it? But next morning comes the, the pain, always. Wherever there is a, a, an imaginary pleasure and self-image as being the conquering hero or the great lover are obviously imaginary. You're in the imagination. Wherever there's one of these, there comes the day of payment. And the interest rate is quite high on it. But we want to have the pleasure without the payment, which is impossible because they're on the level of opposites. So the way to be free of them is to go out on the end of the plank and leap off and say, I am not going to remain in this daydreaming state. And you, did you want to say something? Can I just say something that just came yes, to mind? Yes, go ahead. It seems to me that uh, a lot of this comes from uh, inferior, inferior complex as a child. Is that, uh, is that uh, what you're talking about? Go ahead. It se that's what it seems to me. It seems that a lot of it is built up from a, from a complex. All right. All and right. that builds and builds and builds and builds, you know, like, and then eventually it goes into this, what you're talking about. I think the complex comes first from a childhood, from the parents, and from, from yourself, you feel inferior to everything. All right, all right. Certainly it does come, but do you understand that a complex itself is an image? Yes, nice. See? That. See? I have, let's say I have an inferiority complex with all the suffering that goes with it, the pain, the fawning before you in order to please you so that you like me and I won't feel lonely and all the other false moves it would make. I have an inferiority complex. Do you know what it is? Pure egotism and also an attempt to hang on to an idea about myself. I will do anything except have no idea about who I am, even if I have to say I'm inferior. See, I won't give up the thought. It's nothing but a thought. It isn't you at all, but it's a thought. And this thought of being inferior preserves my image. It's an image of being inferior, all right. But, and then all kind of other tricks will come in. If I am inferior, I'm poor, and I don't have anything, you owe me something, and I will be loaded with violence to get it from you. See, I will use that all the time saying I'm poor and humble and all that. So any kind of an image, both of being inferior or superior, is filled with violence and hatred. Don't, don't trust humble people. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, we're open for discussion. Is that, so part, is that a part of a persecution complex too? Sure. If I am persecuted by you, who is the center of my attention? Me. Isn't that wonderful? I'm the center of your attention. You think about me all day long, think about ways to persecute me. Isn't that wonderful for me? You think about me, I have your attention. See the, the vanity in it? And, and therefore I've, I've kept my neurosis intact. I don't dare giving you up, uh, give you up as an enemy. I give you up as an enemy. I, what do I feel? you left empty. Pardon? You're left empty. Yes, left empty, which is what we're after, to be empty. Mm -hmm. They have no ideas, which is not frightening once you leap off the end of the plank about 70,000 times. First time it's frightening, the next time one-tenth, one percent less frightening, but you keep doing it all the time. Anyone that wants to say anything, you just open it. But you have to catch it. The first step is to see it, which is why attention, alertness, What's going through your mind right now as you're sitting here, okay? What are you thinking about? And don't hold on to it. Look, let it go. Look, let it go. Look, let it go. If you hang on to it, you're forming a self, a cluster of thoughts. You know what the self, is, the false self is? It's a cluster of thoughts, of hardened thoughts, which memory 
they're back in memory, but we bring them out of memory and say, this is I. And this starts from yeah. way back to childhood, as you said, when society and our parents start telling us about ourselves. Mama says things to, to the little girl, Papa says things to her, and this girl, little girl, poor thing, starts to get an idea of how she should behave when she grows up. And it's all wrong because her parents were all wrong. She doesn't know, unless she finally gets tired of paying the price, she doesn't know that it's just a cluster of ideas which everybody is living by, which is not necessary to live by. And when you drop them, there's no more pain. There's no more anxiety. Do what you want. I'm going to be free. You do what you want. I'm going to be free, even if I have to suffer loneliness from not having you in my life anymore. I'm going to go through it. I'm not going to pretend anymore. I'm going to sit right here and just, just shake and shiver and be anxious, not loving it, not loving it, but looking at it in order to understand what on earth is going on inside of me. I want to be out of it. What is this guilt, this uh, debt to society that people feel? I mean, they think that uh, society owes them something, I owe myself to society. Uh, you know, I want to be good, I want right. to be you know, liked and loved and, and respected. And well, let's bring in the word security on that. If I owe you something and you owe me something, we'll probably call it friendship or love or sharing or something like that, which is simply an attempt to feel secure by having, among other things, many distractions in the life. If I can have a, par I can't have a party every night, it's too expensive and I have other things to do, but if I could have a party every night, I would just love it if I am lonely and want something to distract me from facing this awful emptiness. So all this business about uh, owing things to other people and them owing you, it all connects with our attempt to find security, which of course can never be found because the whole thing is based on the illusory self, the illusory I. And the great relief that comes when you see this, is that you don't waste your time, your money, your energies, you don't waste your mind rushing around trying to achieve the impossible. You can't prove that there's a, a horse standing here because there is no horse standing here in front of, in the middle of the room. If you try to prove it, you're going to just drive yourself crazy. It can't be done. Likewise, we can't prove that there is an illusory self that has so many exciting activities. We've covered this before, too. People, notice how eager our people are to tell you how busy they are, how many exciting things they have going for them. I don't have a minute to myself. They're trying to tell you that they exist. They don't exist at all in the sense they think they do. Tell, tell a man that he doesn't exist in the sense that he, think he thinks he does. First of all, he, he won't even be interested in talking about it just to begin with, so you don't say it to begin with. But if you should happen to have a slight interest, he wouldn't understand you at all. Then he would come to a group like this and begin to understand. He'd start to get free of the whole thing. Say, say every day to yourself one thing. Don't do it mechanically. Do it, do it, when you do it consciously, then it's not, not wrong. Say, I want out. And you'll know what you were talking about to yourself, won't you? What about, just for an example, the elections? People, uh, I'm a hot Democrat or I'm a hot Republican, or I like this man, and, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, what importance is there in this, that we think we have so much to say about electing somebody? And, and, well, would someone else answer that in view of what we've already talked about? You know the answer as well as I do. Well, we talked go, about it yesterday. Go ahead, please. Would you, someone like to review it? Well, 
I, I tell him that all the time at home, so I don't know why he's asking that question. <laughs> because when somebody comes into the home and he's all hot about being... I don't think there's anything to talk about. I think he knows the answer to that. Well, I was saying in recent years, I'm not going to vote anymore. There are all a bunch of these, and I don't care which one, one's as bad as the other. I mean, what is the importance of this? Is it my ego that's talking? Is it, uh, am I disgusted with what I see, or? All right. It is quite true, quite true, that there is no value in changing the political structure. Look, you know how old you are, each of you, do you not? How many different local, national, foreign governments have changed since you were a child? Has the change in these governments made you one bit happier, freer? Has it taken away one single problem of yours? It hasn't, has it? And I know, uh, this is repetition, but there's nothing you can do but to repeat, go back to your state. Don't try to find the answer out there. You'll never find it. You never have found it, and you know it. Society knows it hasn't found it. But it refuses to face the fact that nothing can be done on the level of conditioned mechanical thought. Only, it's only a new play with a new title with new actors. But the performance is just as artificial as the play that closed the night before. You know that. There's something in, in all of you that, of course, knows that as a fact. And this is where the, the dismay or disgust comes. It's a fact, no doubt about that. But you don't go on from there to say, what can I see further that would help me on this? You get enjoyment out of criticizing. See? There's, great, there's a great thrill, there's a great ego thrill in saying they're all a bunch of bums. They may be, but why do you waste yourself in talking about this? Why don't you take all this energy, which is enormous, a lot of it, there's an awful lot there, and turn it back onto more self-understanding because you have this one ounce which can grow. Remember what was said at the, at the start? We get taken over by emotions when the mind should be in charge. When the mind is in charge, then you see the whole thing clearly. You don't waste your time. But there's a tremendous attraction in argument. Give up the pleasure of argument, whether it's with another person or with yourself. Don't run mental movies through your mind of how you argue with someone, especially when you won by a, a brilliant exposition, a brilliant point or something, or how you humiliated someone with your great wisdom. Be willing to die to that. Then you won't carry other people around on your back. You're carrying other pe people around when you keep them on your mind, when you love to hate them, so to speak. Don't carry them around. It's a, it's a burden. Get rid of it. Throw it off. Be your own man. Now, one reason we don't do this is because we still don't see quite clearly... We, uh, I'll rephrase that. Because we still think somewhere, back in our mind, incorrectly, that you can do something about that. May I tell you, you're never going to change anything out there. You're not going to change it. Now, you know what I'm going to say next, and I'm going to say it anyway. You can change yourself. You can do that. You can't change your neighbor, and you can't change the social system. It doesn't want change. But you can change yourself so that you are free of everything out there, and there's no fear of it. You can't stop a, an, a ton automobile rolling down a steep hill. If you try to stop it, you're very foolish. And you may destroy yourself in the process because you're unconscious. You don't know that that automobile is mechanical. You don't sense it. You think that you have great powers that can stop it. You can't. You step aside and watch your own, watch your own life so that you don't become an automobile going down there and destroying things.
Yes. You started out with the premise that was new to me, that the emotions and the uh, action are faster than the mind. Right. And I had always thought that you can't have an action or an emotion without first having the thought. No. They all work together in one sense, and in another sense they work at different speeds. In order not to confuse yourself, you watch what happens sometime. And you will find that there is an unconscious thought that starts, what, a gesture? That starts a feeling? There is a thought there. I'm talking about speed. Mm -hmm. You understand? If you keep your mind on rate of speed, that will uh, clear it up for you. Isn't there instinctive action? Instinctive action. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, in other words, it's uh, already in, in, in brain and indoctrinated. But you're very fast. Yeah. Very fast. Before you think. Like, for instance, if a dog jumps at you, instinctively you'll jump back. Without any thought. Yeah, well, that's different. Oh, we're kind of nitpicking here. Yeah. Well, that's what the speed is, you know. yeah. There is such a thing, when you when you see a car coming, you're daydreaming across the street when you shouldn't be, and you see a car coming, you don't really think with memory, really, not really. Your, your body has its own self-protective device which says, get out of the way of that car. You don't stop and ponder and say an automobile is a dangerous thing. You move real fast. That's, a, that's your instinctive, if you want to call it that, instinctive center operating. Can you go into more how the various, the emotions, the mind and the physical body are connected? Is the slowing down of the mind, of our actions, is that so that we'll be able to see them? Yeah, that's the whole purpose. It's normally, you walk down the street at a certain pace, whatever your pace may be, and you're not even, by the way, conscious of your walking until you change it to either faster or slower. That produces a shock, doesn't it? If you walk say 10 steps a minute or whatever it is and then you go either 20 steps or 3 steps it produces a shock because it is now a different pace then your mind is able to actually look at this change in pace because you've changed it remember even as you're sitting here in the space of one second everything is shifting everything is changing right now as we're sitting here thoughts, feelings and a lot of them work Harmoniously, they should work harmoniously, all in the now, without memory being involved. On the other hand, this is very complex, extremely complex. On the other hand, some things are mechanical and should be mechanical, <coughs> like walking or gesturing. But in order to work on yourself, you have to do things with thought deliberately. Remember we said this? I'm sitting at the table, we're sitting at the table having dinner. And I want to suddenly work on myself. I'm working in many ways. Were you working having dinner last night, by the way? Huh? Yeah. Were you observing yes. uh, people around you and, and everything? I know that to some degree you were. But I say I want to now work on myself in one particular way. I've got a dozen ways to do it. So I will reach out for the salt shaker consciously. Now I am doing this deliberately in order to see myself. So I reach out and take it. All right. Ten minutes later, I want the salt shaker again, to put more salt on the salad, or whatever. But I, I don't do it deliberately this time, because I'm now working on something else. I'm watching that man's expression over there, so I reach out without knowing. But that is not wrong, because that is correct mechanicalness. See, before I was doing it deliberately in order to work. Because my mechanical center and yours, and yours has its own work to do. How can we slow the emotions down? When your mind is in charge to a, a small degree and you're able to catch, remember we said this, if you're able to catch a negative emotion at the instant it comes down, it arises, a negative emotion, 
We won't talk about positive ones. Then you can stop it right there because it will no longer be mechanical because consciousness, which is not mechanical, always stops mechanicalness. And there are such things as mechanical emotions. See? If you feel something, by the way, now in consciousness, it's not mechanical. But if you catch, first by having your mind awake and catch the emotion, it won't even come up. You don't even, you not only slow it down, but you cancel it entirely. And you cancel it because you're no longer willing for a negative emotion to build a false you, anger again. If I'm angry, I feel like somebody, but I see that this is a pseudo-self, a uh, false self that has kept me miserable. So I refuse to permit it to come up. Because I, I'm not taking it as myself anymore. And it stops. It's out. I'll fall many times, you understand, in trying to slow it down or to cancel it. Because this is all new, you see. What else shall I do? We justify those thoughts. Whatever they might be. We justify them, did you say? Right. Sure. And this will keep those emotions going. Of course it will. Of course it will. Justification is what keeps it going. And now find out why do we justify it? We have discussed it already. Because we're afraid of letting go. Right now, right this second, if we could see it, we could let go of the past, of memory, which is crowding in every second to try to tell us not only who we are falsely, but how we should behave, which produces artificial nervous behavior, tell us what we should be tomorrow, what we should become, all of which is, is false counsel. Stop justifying and, and protecting, same word, and see what happens. You find out what happens. If you refuse to let memory tell you how you should behave. For a minute, you're going to feel lost. You and I are sitting here talking about any of the politics, let's say. And it starts off gently, as discussions usually do. And you say something that I don't like, and I say something you don't like. Pretty soon, we're taken over because we haven't been watchful. This is because you and I, we're arguing now. You have permitted, and I have permitted, memory to tell me how to talk. And because I would have to let go of my false sense of self if I refuse memory, I don't do it because I'm, I'm lost. You're arguing with me and I'm arguing with you and all of a sudden I catch myself and I remember some of the things we've learned here. And I say, I've got to say something or I'm lost. You try it. You try it and see what a shock it gives you when you refuse to go along with mechanical emotions. Your whole system will shake. You do it, but this is right. You're breaking it. And you're ceasing to waste all this valuable energy that could be poured into self-work, all the forms of self-work. I think by watching everything like most people do mechanically, like get up in the morning and turn on the radio unconsciously and and everything they do through the day is unconsciously and everything you have to do is look at it and just when you go to turn it on just say well you know and go back and don't do it and just see the reaction you get it's really shocking yeah yes it is denying yourself a little pleasure is a good place to work a little pleasure because that's a shock you want another piece of candy out of the candy bowl first of all you're watching are you not you watch the hand reach out Sometimes say to yourself, I'm not going to take this. Watch how you start to suffer. You want that piece of candy because that first one tasted so good. You've got a shock. And if you, and if you find that you did, excuse me, go ahead. No, go ahead. If you find out that you did take the candy, don't make a blunder there and say, oh, I failed. See, because now this is I again failing. Simply be aware that you did not keep your aim that's all, of not taking the candy. You have to do it. You have to see it. The ego wants to be right. right. Wants to win arguments. Right. Wants to be superior. The one arguing with and so forth and so on. 
And so you feel you feel comfortable when you're arguing, do you not? A pseudo comfort. But but have you ever, by the way, do any of you argue? First of all, I should ask them. <laughs> with yourself. Maybe you argue with yourself, but not with other people, because you have an image of being a peaceful person, but you argue with yourself. Have you ever watched yourself argue and see how how nervous you are when you argue? Just notice how nervous you are. If you do nothing else, watch how nervous you are. That is a clue. What is nervousness? It's destructive. I'm nervous. <laughs> Takes away an awful lot of energy. Affects my physical being. Affects a, my whole state of welfare. Yes? You talked about monumental movies. And I can become a little more aware of how much I've run. And you mentioned here this nervousness uh, when you argue. Yeah. And I, I can run it back in my mind, you know, and see who I wanted to argue. I was nervous and so forth. So we're almost continually running these mental movies, aren't we? Right. Usually of the past. Right. right. Oh, they have to be of the past. All right. Now, take call it positive thinking or uh, whatever. Is there a value in your self-conditioning of trying to project yourself mental movies forward into the future and saying it will be like this I won't fall into that old trap now are we just fantasizing yeah yeah uh, Rose is going to answer definitely that's I think that's the worst thing you can do is to project something into the future it's better than well, you've lost running the moment. your old loss no no you've no. lost the moment but the only place that you could get the material for the movie for the projection forward is out of the past, right. so really you're just kidding yourself. That's right. right. Well, because how could you project something you if you're not happy with the past, which is the known? That's why you're going to do this projection thing. Mm -hmm. But the movie comes out of the same can. Yeah. It just says future because someone made a mistake on it. You're just still going to get the same thing because how can you project into the unknown with the known? Right. And how can you say to yourself, I want out of the trap? Because so the that's where you finally say, I don't know how to get out of that's the trap. Right. And about that time, you just float up in the air because you haven't grabbed onto all the things <laughs> down here, and you're there. There's something in, in every human being way deeply buried that already says, I want out of the trap. Their suffering has a certain little voice that says, I don't like this. But it's overpowered by other factors, vanity, for example, that says, I, I love this agitation because I'm afear, afraid of ending memory. Mm -hmm. See, it is never wrong to say, I want out. You have, you, in fact, you have to start with this. But you almost get a mental picture of what it's like to be out. No, 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 you must have no imagination mm -hmm. of what it means to be out. If you have a picture of what it means to be out, as was just said, where are you getting it from? From the same scenario, the same script? <laughs> the way out is not on the level of what? Of thought, of memory. Take just those two for now. Of conditioning. The way out is not in time. Memory is time. The way out is above time. See? So if you project in the future, you're still in time, you're using words, and it doesn't exist anyway. The only time that exists is right now, this very second. So the, the way out is above time. Go ahead and end that if you like. Um, would you say that, um, you say time in all that we're talking about not perfectly, but I'll look at it. Yeah, give a good deal of thought to it. That first, that time really does not exist. We we identify tomorrow and yesterday for convenience and all that. But there is no time. There's only now. There's only a flow. The river flows, and you're standing. The river flows all right, but you're standing at a point and seeing the river flow, and you also also flow with it. But there's no fixed time. But memory deceives us in order to give us the illusion of having a fixed self, which does not exist. We do not exist this second as we're sitting here as a fixed personality. 
There's only a flow of thoughts. And if we let them flow without time, then they don't clog to form this false personality, which is then in conflict with itself and with everybody else, because it's not natural. It doesn't really exist. Well, you see that problems are really, really illusory because the person who caused them are illusory. When, when you get rid of the, the, the false self, it, 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 what's left can't have any problems. All problems are caused by thinking that we exist as a fixed personality. Then, then having this fixed personality, we want to add to it. And woe unto you if you try to take it away from me. You and I are going to fight. Yes? My mother used to be a very worrisome person. Everything. She worried about everything that she could think of to worry about. And I used to observe it. And I used to say to her, Mom, why do you worry about things that haven't happened? 95 to 99% of these things won't happen. Because it's been proven in the past that these things that you worried about never took place. Now, isn't this a problem with most people? They worry about things that that usually 99% of the time won't happen. What is the meaning of it? All, all right, all right. Now, first of all, you understand that what you said is on the level of a reasoning, mm -hmm. which is not what we're going into. That is true that most of the things we worry about do not happen. But if we take this as a comfort, we're just making another blunder. We're going to go far above that and destroy the whole thing. Why does... All right. What is worry? Worry is the fear that something out there, which is really not out there anyway, but we're saying it, that something out there will put an end to my, quote, self, my, quote, life. This is the whole thing. There is nothing else. You see how important it is to, to hammer away on this point? If you see this, then you'll never ask questions. Of what should I do about this uh, friend who wants to leave me? What should I do about the fact that, that uh, all of a sudden my finances were drained by unexpected illness? There are no questions anymore because there's no false self bringing up these questions because it's anxious about its, quote, itself. End quote. It doesn't exist anymore. And when it doesn't exist, then all complaint vanishes, which does not mean that you don't see the insanity out there. You do see how cruel human beings are, how they have no conscience. But you have no complaint because you're not trying to create an opposite out there of a persecutor in order to feel persecuted in order to exist as a persecuted person. If I call myself persecuted, I say that I exist, right? This is a falsehood. This is a lie. But I'm afraid to let go of feeling persecuted. And by the way, if I feel persecuted, woe unto you the first chance I get to persecute you. You mean you'll retaliate with vengeance? Pardon? You mean you'll retaliate with vengeance? Yes, and especially if you can do it in the name of God and religion. <laughs> or some other nice, lovely word. How many people have been burned at the stake in the name of God? Mm -hmm. Always brings me to mind of the French. Huguenot and the, uh, the religious war they had between the Catholic and Protestant. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where the brother against father, son mm -hmm. against mother, I mean, you know, where they were actually killing each other to, make, yes. to keep the Protestants from taking over the control from the Catholic mm -hmm. Church. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, if you're a student of history, you see it all through history, huh? Yes. People kill each other in the name of God and religion and good and so forth. You, do you then see that labels breed violence? Yep. Any label 
creates violence. Because when you have a label where a label A must create label B. Where there's label B, he becomes very necessary to you. Wherever you have an A, B becomes necessary to fight. At the level of thought. Pardon? At the level of thought. Yes, at the level of conditioned thought, wrong thought, call it what you want. Because you have to create the opposite. Yes, you must. When you're no longer thinking in an effort to form a self, then your thought is okay. Then you, you think to drive your car carefully or wind the clock or whatever. Then thought yeah. is in its right mind. Yeah. When you're trying to use practical thought yeah. for psychological or something, right? Yes. Yeah. Then yeah. you have to create the opposite in the yeah. psychological thing. Otherwise, it's in a vacuum. And yeah. Then you're making a mistake. So what do you do? We've covered this. Then you live consciously without thought. When you're not in practical thought, you live without thought, which is which is a state of in, of true intelligence. Because you're not trying to prove anything, you're not trying to, you're not trying to, be, you're not straining at anything. What is there to get? Do you see this? What is there to get? There's nothing to get. There's on nothing the, to lose either. Pardon? There would be nothing to lose. Right, right. Of course, nothing to lose. You, what, what's there to lose? An invisible person doesn't. How can you lose or gain anything? You, you understand? We're, we become invisible. In other words, we don't exist but we still exist, but in a different way. Where's the strain? Where's the anxiety anymore? Who, who is there to get anxious, to worry? Who is there? He's not there. He's not standing there. A man, no one standing there can worry. <laughs> then, on your, on your everyday level, you handle every... How can you do anything but handle everyday affairs perfectly? Do you, as a separate ego self, apart from the groceryman, the banker, the wife, the husband, the child, you don't exist as an opposite to them. You're in relation with them all the time. You're talking to them. They're asking you questions. But you don't exist as an opposite to them. And you're not using them and exploiting them. And if they should try to exploit you, you'll see it right now. And you won't let it happen. Because you're contri then contributing to their neurosis, to their building of a false self. Don't give people thrills. Don't give them dramatizations. And you don't have to give them anything. When, when you are one with yourself, which is another way of stating what we have just stated, when you're one with yourself, what is your effort to give anybody anything? Well, I'm not talking about giving them the salt when they ask for it at the dinner table. We, we, give, we give largely, in most cases, because we want to prove something. And you know what it is we're trying to prove. That we are the giver. There is giving and there is taking. But there is no giver and there is no taker. If there is a giver, there is vanity. I gave. Is if, is if you made it with your own brilliant intelligence anyway. The flow of life gave you all that money. And you think you're generous because you give it to this charitable group or that group. How did you get it? You, you, you thought you got it through individual effort. It did not just happen that way through a thousand events happening the way they did. You say, yes, but I determined I wanted to make all this money. That again was a mechanical thought which contributed to the thousand of mechanical fun. So you don't give a thing. So where, again, where is vanity there? It doesn't exist anymore, does it? Uh, this con concept is better to give than to receive give of thyself, and so forth and so on. Yeah. This is what you're referring to. When, did you want to go on? No. Did you? When you begin to work, how do you put an end to the nonsense of a separate self? By giving it away, instead of hoarding it. By letting it go, by dissolving it. 
letting everything go so that there's nothing left. So there is some connection there, or I suppose we could go on to some other ways, but if you give of yourself, because you're not hoarding anything, psychologically, we're not talking about material things, that straightens itself, you give yourself out. Even if you make a big mistake on giving something out, but you're working and experience a shock of some kind, you can look back and see that you gave in vanity, maybe. You give of yourself without effort. If you give of yourself with a strain, with an effort, if you go around doing good to people because you're a good Christian or whatever, you're going to be strained about it, and you're going to feel resentful that you put out your time and money. You're not giving a thing, really. You're trying to prove something, that you are a giver. Giving, true giving, is effortless. It may or may not involve physical things, but it starts with sitting. To give of yourself means nothing more, nothing more than to have found yourself. And you don't have to make any effort whatsoever to save the world. Because that is neurosis to think that you can save the world. And when you have saved yourself, you cease all efforts to save people out there. They will, they will take what you have to give and they will distort it and demand more and you're going to be in an awful lot of trouble. When we've worked on ourselves up to a certain point, we cease to attract trouble, cease to attract problems. Because being in a state of consciousness which never tries to prove itself, which never tries to get comfort from anyone, which never tries to get security, you cease to attract people whom you formerly attracted because your neurosis was attracting their neurosis. And you say, let's settle down to a nice happy life together and keep each other comfortable. And this is simply two enemies allied for the temporary purpose of fighting off a hostile and terrifying world. <coughs> and you fight like mad. So as your, your false self dissolves, false needs dissolve, and therefore you don't attract anyone. You don't have anything to do with those people you used to have things to do with. You see that you have nothing to give them and they have absolutely nothing to give you. Thank heaven I don't have to go out and waste my time and my energy and even my money anymore in an attempt to feel secure. And then, you, you, have you ever met people, you think, you, you, you'll all nod your heads, have you ever met people in your past life that you wish you'd never got involved with? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this won't happen again. No, it won't happen. You'd be very sharp. You'd be able to see people at a glance. And the first thing, the first thing is simply on the level of knowledge. You know, when you go out and you see a, an auditorium filled with 5,000 people, you know that almost certainly, it'll be one chance in a million, almost certainly every one of them is a lost human being. Even if they appear very respectable and very intelligent. So you don't get involved in them. This is not defense, this is intelligence. Defense is another thing. If, you, if you're defending, this means you're involved wrongly. Okay? Once you get involved wrongly, now you have to defend your position. If you have no position to defend, you don't get involved with anyone. One time Krishna Murthy said, if you people were right, and he was talking to 5,000 people, he said you wouldn't be here. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't need me. Right. That's it. Right. I think there were a few right people there, though. Well, we, uh, we understand. Well, that. I know, but I mean, he, he was, he well, went in a different sense. Right. That they were seeking and needing and making a point, yeah. Right. Because obviously they did come to hear him, and he obviously was telling them things, which is good. That is very good. So apparently there was no need to go hear him for these people. Yes. It is never wrong to want to know. You understand? 
It's a stage. You must want to know. All right, now by the same token, on that subject. In the, same, in the next breath, he says, you don't need these gurus, these preachers, these masters, and everything. You see? In other words, there is a contradiction there. It sounds like, sounds like, I mean, well, it sounds, but it really isn't. No, it really isn't. Yet. You both do need them and you don't. Yeah. And I don't see any contradiction at all. <laughs> no, but I mean, it sounds contradictory because here, yeah. one breath, he right. says, you right. wouldn't be here if you didn't need right. it. Second place, right. you don't need me. We start by reading books and listening to, to people who know because we have a need. We have the need because we don't understand that we don't really need. But we do need them to understand them. Right. Well, so there's no contradiction. No, no, no. no, that's what I mean. I'm not yeah. saying that. I know. I know. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Right. <laughs> right. It's the same thing. We have, we have to work. <laughs> They've given uh, doing nice things to others, giving gifts. Yeah. Okay. You're right on that. Because if I want to give some to somebody, and if he refuses me, if he refuses that present or whatever I'm giving him, I get angry. <laughs> right. Hmm? And why? You tell us. That's because my false self was refusing his vanity of being a, a giver. A giver, right. That's right. That's good detection. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when you, when you give somebody something, there's all kind of little fears in you. If you do something for somebody, you, you get to worry, well, maybe they'll ask me for something again tomorrow. You may do that too. <laughs> now you're afraid to say no because you've already established the little image of doing the first good thing. Now you're afraid to stop. Stop it at the start that you won't get into it in the first place. This also comes from wanting to be good. And yeah. Be a good gooder. Well, we, we just don't know. But the, from the very start, everybody tells us to be good as children. And in itself, it is not wrong, because that's the only place you can start with children, just tell them to be good, to give them a simple idea, a broad generalization, that we should be good. Now, that is fine. but. Because we're so confused, we immediately fall into images of what it means to be good. Instead of being good by not existing as a separate person from everybody else on earth. This is so far advanced, nobody ever gets it. And so we begin to live in images of goodness, which creates resentment and fighting. The good man is the man who no longer exists in self-images about himself. That is a good man. That is a man with a conscience. That is a man who doesn't start wars in the home or internationally. And such people are very hard to find. So, you know, if we can see, if I can see, What I am doing to myself by living in these images and these illusions and in these demands, if I can really catch one glimpse of how I am pounding myself, that will do it. That will start it. But I don't see it. I don't know the difference between pure water and impure water. And I drink the impure and call it pure because I've never been able to distinguish between the two. But if I'm watching my thrill over you flattering me, you flatter me and tell me how wonderful I am, and you say it because you want something from me, by the way. You want me to flatter you back. That's a trait. But I see my thrill of flattery, and instead of being gullible and swallowing it 
whole, because it affirms my image of being such a wonderful person, and you have affirmed it, I see that it is false, and I see that I am now worried because you flattered me at nine o'clock. I hope you flatter me at 10, and from quarter to 10 on, I start to get anxious, and 10 o'clock comes, and five after 10 comes, now I hate you. I said I loved you, now I hate you because you didn't flatter me again. I can begin to see the whole thing and seeing how I'm destroying myself, then when you flatter me, it will fall on nothing. I will simply see it, and I will see your motive for it, by the way, but I won't say anything to you. Fall on nothing. Now, I'm not destroying myself. If I can see what I do to myself by accepting illusion as truth, I can see it. That's the beginning of the end. I go real fast from that point on. Because I don't want to hurt myself. I've, I've lived that way too long. No more. Does that mean that a thoroughly aware person never gives? Never gives? He gives all the time. Did you say gives? Yes. Yeah. Well, what are you talking about giving? Materially? Psychologically? Both ways. Pardon? Both ways. The question doesn't come up. Do you know how to answer that question? You make yourself a whole person and the question will vanish. Because I won't consider the gift. Uh, remember I said there's giving, but there's no giver. There's no giver. That's vanity to that's, think. That's good. If you're a whole person, you'll just give off something that's you know, you'll give off something, but it won't be anything that you could name. And there's no thought connected to it. See? There's no thinking. If there's thinking, thought again, see? Thought creates the giver. If there's no thought, there's no giver, therefore no vanity, and no expectation of something in return. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> giving, gi giving, you touched on a point that what we really want to get into and what we should understand is this, this automatic giving of cosmic wholeness, if you want to call it that, in which there's no effort at all. You can give. You give just by being. Someone receives, but you don't even know you give. That's right. It, it's automatic. Yeah. Because the truth is flowing. That says flow. Yeah. Or like it's a flame that ignites. Right. right. And those who want it will catch it. Will catch those it. who don't want it, which is the majority, of course, won't even know what it's talking about. They'll call it religious talk or something like that. Well, it could also be materialistic. You could give it the same thing. Same you might. Thing. You might. I mean, if you're talking about material giving, it could also be on the same level. Every time you... Not being a giver, but giving. Do, do this. If you give something material, a gift, then simply, again, do what you always have to do. Watch your state of mind as you give it. Try to see if there is a self-giving there or not. See if there's any vanity in, in giving. See if you're watching their face so that it lights up with appreciation for you. <laughs> See? Because this is what we want mostly when we give, to watch the expression and have them like us. Then they'll give us what we want. If there's, if there's no self in the giving, that is right giving. No hope of reward, no expectation. No pictures of being generous. Let's take maybe 10 more minutes and we'll stop. That's what I do. When I gave something to somebody, I didn't want no gift from them, but I want a smile from appreciation. Okay. They didn't smile. <laughs> well, they, they could still keep the present, but... Uh, with the taken back of your You're a hard bathroom. <laughs> Isn't that funny? A lot of times you give something and you don't get the response you expected. You say, why did I, why did I give it to them? Right, right. I should have. Right. <laughs> I didn't give it to one. Return. Right, right. I'll tell you a starting point. Now this is on the simple level, just like be good. This is on the simple level. Let's start with simple things. Stop being afraid of people, of their reactions, of what they can do to you, 
of their power, authority, if they have any. Stop being afraid of people because there's no need to be afraid of anyone. And if you don't exist as a, as a hardened ego self, how can you be afraid of them? They have nothing to give you, nothing to take away from you. But stop, start with that simple statement, I am not going to be afraid of anyone anymore. Now, it won't happen overnight, but this is the, the first step, and a very good one. This is your aim, not your accomplishment. This is your aim. Yes? No. Oh. I'm not going to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid because when I am afraid, I suffer. And I'm not going to suffer anymore. You have, you have to get emotional. Right, right emotions. Uh -huh. They become your allies. Get feeling into it. This, this doesn't work on the intellectual level alone. That has its place in knowledge. Get your feelings into it. Don't be afraid of your feelings. Don't be afraid of feeling anything. It's a part of you. It's very natural. And it becomes purified, clarified. Hooray for you when you get a troubled feeling if you are working. It doesn't want to let go. The man who came to dinner, is that the name of the play? The man who came to dinner for one night, he stayed for a month. This is what these negative feelings are. We invited them in because we didn't know any better. Now they become guests and we don't know what on earth to do with them or how to get rid of them. We're learning how to get rid of them. And not being afraid of their wrath. We're always afraid of someone taking revenge on us. Why don't you find out what happens if the, I'm talking psychologically, you understand, not physically. Why don't you find out what happens if, if something in you gets revenge, you'll find out eventually. This is tremendous. I'll tell you what to do. Every day, at least once a day, you call the bluff on something that tries to hoax you, to frighten you, to bluff you. You stand there and face the ghost and say, you wave your arms, make moaning sounds, and roll your eyes. And I'm going to just stand there and watch you, and pretty soon you'll get amused by the performance. When you get amused by the performance, it will fade away. It, 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 it knows it's lit. That's right. Neurosis, neurosis gets tired after a while and departs. can no longer take you over. It goes away. You watch it, you can see it walk away. A little less every day when you do something. Now I'm going to give you a, a, a work project, which you work on from now on, and then we'll stop. It's very easy, it's, it's not complex. We will wait till the pencil and paper come down. Very simple, but I'll explain it a little bit, and then you just see if you do it. This connects with everything we've ever talked about, including today. You have ample opportunities tomorrow, today. Whenever someone asks you a question of any kind, Answer the question in just as few words as you can, giving them complete information. Now, if you will start to do this, you will see a resistance to it. You will say, <laughs> the old nature will say, ah, another opportunity to blab endlessly. Someone asked you, may I have the salt? And you go into a long dissertation about how salt was mined in Arabia and all. Say yes and hand them the salt and be done with it. Someone asks you a question at work. You see how efficient you can be in giving them a complete answer. You're not sloughing off. Maybe, the, maybe it's sufficient to say yes or no. Maybe not. You have to judge that. Say yes, the package you want is on top of the third shelf around the left corner. Stop. <laughs> then after you've done this, Examine yourself and see how many extra words you blabbed into there that you didn't have to put in there. You understand the value of all this, don't you? It's breaking mechanical thought. You're saving energy in talking. 
You're saving wrong emotions because maybe you get a thrill out of saying, oh yes, I can help you get to San Francisco. You go up around this way. You're all excited that someone has asked your precious opinion on how to get to San Francisco. Summary. When someone asks you a question, answer it as briefly and as concisely and as efficiently as you can and then stop. And you will see a little bit of pressure. You won't want to stop. Do it anyway. And repeat this over and over. It'll help you in any way. That's all.